Well, it's certainly nice seeing all of you in the, our Zoom boxes this morning. Welcome everyone to the National Maritime Historical Society seminar series. My name is Jessica McFarlane and I'll be your Zoom host this morning. And let's see, I think we have a, still a couple of people coming in. So I'm just gonna wait one more moment. Okay. We are so pleased to have with us today our own trustee elect, Dr. Sal Marcogliano, and he is going to present a remarkably timely topic, of course. It's been a year since the start of the pandemic, and Sal will be speaking with us today about the impact of COVID-19 on the maritime industry. We are also quite thrilled that our own NMHS trustee and chairman emeritus, Clay Maitland, who is the managing partner of International Registries, Inc., which administers one of the largest ship registries in the world, will introduce our speaker. Before that, though, if you'll just allow me to tell you a little bit about the format for today's presentation. Sal is going to be speaking for about 40 minutes and presenting a slideshow on your screens. And for the best sound quality, uh, we are going to be muting everyone's audio just so that uh, no one misses anything. Also, as is the custom for our seminars, we reserve the last 15 minutes or so for questions and answers. And we're delighted that our Sea History editor and good friend of Sal's, uh, Deirdre O'Regan, will be moderating those questions. Right, most from people the audience. are uncovered, so I'll take the table off. Oops, I'm sorry. You know. There we go. Um, where was I? So thank you all first to those who submitted questions in the uh, when they responded with the registration form. Uh, Sal is gonna do his best to weave those answers into the um, his uh, talk. Um, you can also post questions in the chat feature, which is on the bottom menu of your computer screen, or it's under more if you're participating on a smartphone. So without further ado, please welcome NMHS trustee and chairman emeritus Clay Maitland. It's a great pleasure to be able to uh, introduce uh, Sal Mark, Dr. Sal, as I call him, uh, not for the first time. Uh, I think we're becoming uh, kind of familiar with each other. And it's a great pleasure for me to be back with uh, all of you folks uh, at NMHS. Uh, brings back a lot of very uh, pleasant memories. And, and uh, I want to congratulate uh, you and Birchie for the work that you're doing uh, in these difficult times, which Sal is going to talk about in a few seconds. Sal Mercogliano is an associate professor at, of history at Campbell University in North Carolina. He's an adjunct professor of maritime industry, industry policy at the uh, Kings Point, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy uh, in uh, Kings Point, New York. Uh, he's an author, published author, for a fourth arm of defense, sea lift and maritime logistics in the Vietnam War. Uh, in addition to being a trustee elect of NMHS, he serves as vice president of the North American Society for Oceanic History, uh, and he is a member of the Sea History Editorial Advisory Board. Uh, he's a former licensed merchant mariner, needless to say, and he married uh, his shipmate, uh, the then ensign, Kathy Anderson, uh, who served with him aboard the U.S. Uh, uh, Naval Ship Comfort, the hospital ship, during the Persian Gulf War. Uh, she is now Lieutenant Commander Kathy Mercogliano, and they just recently celebrated their 28th wedding anniversary. Uh, congratulations, uh, Sal and, uh, and Kathy. Uh, uh, and now it is a great pleasure to turn the proceedings over to Sal. Well, thank you, Clay. I appreciate that very much. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to come today and, and talk to you all. Uh, this is a topic that's, a, a, for me, great interest and, and I've been happy to have been able to talk about this quite a bit. You know, my career as a maritime historian and then teaching maritime industry policy for the Merchant Marine Academy puts me in a very unique position. Uh, one of the things that I think that NMHS does very well is get out the, the history of, of America in its sea lift, in its, in its Merchant Marine, in its sailing to the general public, which I think is a great, great thing. I think one of the flaws we have right now in our system is we don't talk about the current situation facing the maritime industry, the role of sea transportation in everyone's everyday life. And so one of the things I've, I've kind of embarked on recently, and it, it started a few years ago when I got asked to chair a panel at uh, the National Air uh, and Sea Expo Exposition down in Washington, D.C., 
is really kind of get out there and bring together what's going on in the maritime industry and present it to the public. Uh, there are many people in this group right now that I see who are experts in, in a lot of these fields who know much more about this than I do. But one of the things I aim to do is really bring together these very different aspects of the maritime industry and present them so that everybody can understand them. Unfortunately, the maritime industry, much like maritime history, tends to be very siloed. And people tend to focus on their one particular area without a lot of cross connection and, and looking beyond that. And so one of the things that particularly has happened with the outbreak of COVID is the impact it's had on the maritime industry. And unfortunately, it, the time the maritime industry gets in the news is usually during a disaster of some kind. And this is uh, an opportune time to bring it up because COVID-19 has directly impacted the maritime industry. And so what I want to do is just run through the different areas here and, and really kind of give you a, a brief kind of overview of the maritime industry, some, and, and not all by any means, of the issues facing the maritime industry, and then really address your questions at the end and, and see if, if there's anything I can do to kind of expand on it a little bit more. So I, I put together uh, a presentation for you, mainly because I know no one wants to look at me the entire time. This is always a, a, a thing I learned a long time ago is to make sure that we have a, a, a different view here for you. So let me see, there we go. So, uh, this information comes from a, a publication uh, out by the United Nations. This is the Review of Maritime Transport. Every year since 1968, uh, they release a publication that really kind of catches what's going on in, in the maritime world. And this document really caught what was going on in 2019. The 2020 publication just came out in, in, in uh, back in November. And one of the things we saw that was going on before COVID-19 was a slowdown in maritime trade. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the trade tensions between two of the biggest trading partners in the world, the United States and China. Go back to pre-COVID-19, you had tariffs, you had a kind of a trade war going on. And one of the things we saw was really a decline in maritime trade. Now, one of the things that you should know as a, as a good historian, I have to bring in the historical analogies here. Uh, you'll see right there that in 2019, we shipped just a little bit over 11 billion tons of cargo. To, to put that in the context, in 1950, the world shipped a half a billion tons of cargo. We have increased the amount of goods we move on the high seas 22 fold since 1950. So in 70 years, we've uh, increased uh, just exponentially in the number of uh, cargo we move and our ability really to move goods across the ocean. Uh, in 2020, we hit a landmark, even though this chart doesn't quite show it here, we have over 100,000 ships now that are on the high seas, over 100 gross tons. Uh, that are out there. Uh, and, and that's an amazing uh, number when you tend to think about that, how many ships are out there and, and what they're doing. Uh, the vast majority of them, the bulk of them are actually bulk carriers. These are vessels that carry grain or ore on the world's oceans. That's the, really the biggest sector or biggest area we're seeing growth right now. Uh, everybody tends to think it's oil tankers. It's not actually oil tankers are, are, are decreasing a little bit. And we see that going down. Uh, but the area we see it is really the, the movement of the earth, uh, uh, grains and ores uh, around the ocean. And even though 2019 saw a, 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 just a, a small growth of 0.5% growth, uh, the perception was we were going to see 2 to 3% growth in the maritime sector over the next couple of years. That was the envisionment. That's what everybody saw. Well, of course, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. When we hit into the beginning of 2020, there was an issue that everybody thought was gonna be the issue that was going to dominate 2020. And that was IMO 2020. This is the International Maritime Organization uh, implementing a new uh, emission standard for vessels. They wanted to get vessels reducing the amount of sulfur they were dumping into the, into the atmosphere. And so there was a big push for low sulfur diesel fuel out there, kind of really you know prevent greenhouse gases from building up. This was gonna be accomplished through either that low sulfur diesel or through the installation of scrubbers, <clears throat> excuse me. And so that was the big issue. Everyone, you know, early 2020, that's what everybody was talking about in the maritime industry. This was the big issue. And this is a, an ongoing issue I should mention because there's, there's further technology introductions going on here in ship propulsion. Uh, if you read maritime journals or if you follow the news, uh, you're going to see some new designs for vessel propulsion coming out. One of the biggest ones right now is ammonia propulsion, using ammonia as fuel, uh, LNG as fuel, uh, uh, a hybrid battery power. 
Uh, but, but anything that does not produce these sulfur oxide and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is, is going to be the thing. And that was what everybody expected. That was going to be the big story. And it turned out to be the big story at the beginning of the year. But then COVID hit. And one of the things we start to see with COVID is these disruptions begin to happen. And we had seen disruptions previously in this. You know, we've seen disruptions in the maritime industry before. Uh, lots of times you'll see it with natural disasters. A hurricane rolls into the Gulf of Mexico and you shut down fuel shipments out of the Gulf Coast. Uh, in 2016, we had the collapse of Hanjin Marine, uh, which was one of the, the seventh largest container liner in the world. And we saw a disruption in that. We've seen strikes on the West Coast and that causes a disruption. But COVID-19 was unique because the closest I can come to an analogy of COVID-19 was a world war, basically. It, it created a huge disruption in the trade that is still having ripple effects to this day. Uh, when China shut down, when, when Wuhan happened and all of a sudden China shut down, one of the things we saw was a marked decrease in the amount of goods coming out of China. And we saw a marked decrease on imports going into China. Believe it or not, China imports more than exports, largely through bulk material. But that had a massive impact on trade. Three to four weeks later, that's going to have an impact on goods coming across the Pacific or going on that main route between Asia and Europe. And COVID has that impact. And what we're seeing now is, is still the ramifications from that. And I'm going to talk about some of those ramifications in different areas. And, and what I like to do is take you through the major areas in the, in the, in the maritime industry, talk about impact on, on them with, with just an example of two of each. And I'm happy to expand during the questioning about it if you, have, if you want to go a little bit more in depth in those areas. So one of the big ones, uh, obviously, that happened was the cruise ship industry. Uh, in many ways, the cruise ship industry was the, was the catalyst for COVID. This was the Ruby Princess, the Diamond Princess. Uh, th this is the one that really captured, for many people, and many in the West in particularly, this is where COVID made its introduction. We, we saw this happen on the cruise ships. And cruise ships are really ripe for this type of thing. We've seen outbreaks of, of, of norovirus and, and other issues on board ships in the past, and one of the things that we saw, especially for Princess Cruise Lines, they seem to be the one who, who were hit hardest. And it's largely because what it was found out, there was a study done by the Australians. And it appears that the way they operated their crew, they would bring their crew to a central receiving place, train them, and probably COVID was introduced there. And then their crew was sent out to the ships. And that's probably what happened. But we saw the introduction of, of, of COVID. Now, obviously, the cruise industry is a massive industry. It's a massive industry. Uh, this comes from cr Cruise Industry News. This is their little uh, infographic they did for 2019. 404 ships, 27.8 million passengers. They generate $41 billion in revenue a year. Uh, the three largest cruise lines, Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian, operate 194 vessels, about 80% of the world's cruise vessels, major cruise vessels, these, these kind of mega cruise ships. And one of the things that we saw eventually happen is the cruise industry shut down. It shut down. Now, what's interesting is it didn't really shut down. While there was no passengers on board, the cruise companies kept their ships active. They kept their ships on standby for a variety of reasons, not the least of which th these ships are not designed to turn off. In other words, they're not designed to come pier side and hook up in the shore power. And many of the facilities where they dock don't have shore power for these vessels. There was a story just the other day of Miami putting in shore power facilities or, or a proposal to put in shore power facilities in their... Uh, so that these vessels, when they come in, can literally turn off engines and, and shift over to shore power. But this slowdown all of a sudden stopped the cruise industry. And what you saw were parking lots of cruise ships in the Bahamas, off Manila, off Singapore, uh, off the West Coast, and just basically sitting there. And the cruise industries kept their crews on board, both the operating crews and the hotel crews, for the concept that the cruise industry is going to kick right back up. This is going to be a little bit of a blip. We'll be going, it's March of 2020, we'll be back going by the summer. We'll be back going by the, the, the fall. Well, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And not only did it not happen, but they had an issue with returning their crews. Their crews signed on board for specific periods of time. And they had a real difficult time getting their crews back home. Matter of fact, one of the things the cruise industries had to do was a massive cross-decking operation where they put all the crews from like the Philippines on one or two vessels and had to sail the vessel to the Philippines 
because they could not get the crews flown back home. And one of the things that we saw in the cruise industry is right off the bat is they started losing money. It's estimated that the three big companies, the three big cruise industries are losing about a billion dollars a month uh, in, in revenue right now. They're, they're basically shoveling out money to keep the ships running, to keep the ships operating. And what are they doing to offset that? Well, one of the things they're doing is scrapping ships like crazy. Uh, a lot of the older vessels, ships built in the late 80s, early 90s are, are winding up. This is an image of them in Turkey. These are two former Royal Sovereign, uh, 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 two uh, Royal Caribbean vessels, the Sovereign class, which were running for Pulimenta, uh, and three of the uh, Carnival uh, Fantasy class uh, being scrapped in Turkey right now. And one of the reasons that they're really scrapping older vessels very quickly is they have new vessels coming out of the way. This is the uh, uh, pulling out of a, of a new cruise vessel uh, from the facility up at Meyer in uh, Germany. Uh, they have those vessels in program. They're being built right now. And one of the things that the cruise industry is scrambling with right now is to get passengers back on board. There have been several attempts to restart it, but each time it, it kind, of, kind of fails. Uh, probably the, the, the worst case scenario is Richard Branson's Virgin Cruises, which was set to premiere in April of 2020. Man, that was bad timing. He, he just has not, he's literally got two brand new cruise ships, never been used before, sitting there waiting to get out. And, and they haven't been able to use. And, and so the cruise industry is a good indication. Now, the reason that the cruise industry has not collapsed is because these companies are so large. These, these are literally consolidations. And that's something we see in the, in the shipping industry, consolidations, these companies that are li literally too big to fail out there. Uh, they're, they're incorporated overseas. Uh, they operate with uh, crews from around the world. Uh, but more importantly, they can basically uh, leverage their vessels for loans, for stock options. We've seen that with, with, with Carnival and Royal Caribbean and Norwegian, uh, selling stocks in their vessels, basically taking loans against their vessels. Because again, if you look at their portfolios for 2022, 2023, they're selling cruises. And a lot of people will sit there and tell me, no one's going to go on a cruise again. It's never going to happen. Well, my example is Costa Concordia. Uh, if, if you can have an, a, a captain run into Europe and sink his vessel uh, because he wanted to wave to shore as he went by and kill 32 of his passengers while he abandons the vessel and leaves the ship to themselves and people still get on cruise ships, this is not going to phase them. This is not going to phase them. And we, we expect to see the cruise industry going on. I think what you're going to see is a clearing out of some of the smaller sub-operating lines. We've already seen that. Royal Caribbean and Pulimentar, uh, you know, that company basically went under. But you'll see some of the more specialty lines maybe start collapsing. Uh, in the oil industry, uh, oil industry, again, is, is, is a very unique industry. Uh, it's, a, it's a very unique industry for forever it was controlled by what was called the Seven Sisters. Uh, these were the seven big oil companies. You know, it was Gulf, it was Exxon, it was Mobil, it was BP, it was Standard, it was Texaco, it was Shell. Uh, they controlled everything. And, and they were a textbook example of what we call vertical integration. They controlled the oil fields, they controlled the refineries, they controlled the transportation, and then they controlled the distribution, and then they controlled the retail. And so they controlled all elements of the oil industry. And the, the Seven Sisters controlled over 60% of the world's oil distribution. It, it, was, it was massive. And obviously one of the things we've seen in the oil industry, and this is one of the things that came right out of World War II, was the economy of scale. We talk about mega ships today. We talk about super ships. Well, oil tankers were the classic example of that. You go from the standard World War II T2 tanker that handles about 16,000 tons of oil and then you start going into these very large to ultra large crude carriers, which are really not as common today as they were once in the past. But you have fairly large 200,000, 300, you know, 200,000 ton oil tankers out there that operate between them. The, the issue became with the Seven Sisters was they ran into problems in the late 70s and late 80s. One of the things they loved to do was put their name on the side of vessels. It was great. It was if you're Amoco, if you're Exxon, why not tout the fact that you have an oil tanker fleet? Uh, that works great until you run ashore somewhere and dump hundreds of thousands of gallons of oil into the ocean. And now your name, Amico, Cadiz, Exxon Valdez, is plastered up there with a picture of an oil-soaked duck or a, a pelican. 
And so what happened was the oil companies tried to kind of hide their industry, but eventually they basically got out of the market entirely of operating these ships. And what you see now in the oil industry is a lot of operating companies, a lot of operating companies that basically serve that service. And what we're starting to see again in the oil industry is consolidation. You're seeing the growth of these oil companies. Right now, it's fairly diffused. You don't have really like the big mega companies that control large blocks, but you're starting to see that happen. You're starting to see that happen again. And oil distribution was fairly significant. To give you the COVID issue, uh, some of you may remember that, you know, about April and May of 2020, gas prices were great. I mean, I live in North Carolina. We were selling gas for like $1.50 a gallon. You know, I wanted to fill up my car and I don't mean the gas tank. I mean, the back seat. I wanted to fill it up with, with gas. I just wanted to have gas because it was so cheap. And that had to do with obviously a decrease in, in demand. Uh, you can't just turn off the spigots of the pumps uh, in the oil fields. You're still producing oil. And one of the things that we saw in the oil industry is that oil tankers were at a premium because they needed them as storage uh, facilities. Uh, you needed to basically put this oil somewhere. Shore facilities were filling up. And so you saw massive anchorages of oil tankers laden with oil off of the West Coast of the United States. You couldn't get an oil tanker into a West Coast port because there was no place to put the oil ashore. And what that did was depress our oil uh, gas prices, which is great, but there's a hidden issue behind the, the scenes. Uh, when fracking was introduced in the United States, fracking had a, a detrimental effect on the offshore oil industry. Now, the offshore oil industry obviously had a lot of problems itself, Deepwater Horizon. Uh, and so one of the things that happened was it, it's, it was too expensive to get oil offshore. It's much e cheaper to get it with fracking. And so fracking took off. Problem with fracking was it was very much like the mortgage industry in the, in, in the early 2000s. Uh, there was a lot of debt with expected revenue to come later. And unfortunately, what happened in early 2020 is OPEC and Russia flooded the market with oil. I mean, just flooded the market. They just opened up the spigots and flooded the market. And one of the things that they, they did was basically try to drive out the fracking industry. And they were pretty successful. Chesapeake Oil, which was the largest fracking industry uh, uh, company in, in, in the world or in the United States, went under, declared bankruptcy. And when you start seeing the, the, the escalation of, of gas prices when the world shifts back into a normal routine, uh, this is the issue behind it. It's not because of any specific political party or, or policy. It's, it's because, again, uh, one of the things that we, we saw happen is several organizations, OPEC and Russia in particular, took advantage of a situation and were able to dump huge quantities of oil on the industry to try to run them out, which is a, a fairly common tactic we see. Uh, besides the transportation of bulk oil, we always see the transportation of bulk material, uh, grain, for example, coal, iron. And you know, one of the biggest consumers of this bulk material is China. China actually imports more than it exports. That's, that's not usually known in terms of tonnage. Uh, but it's, it's getting grain, it's getting ore. Uh, right now in China, China is suffering uh, tremendously uh, due to food shortages because of flooding of the Yangtze River and the Yellow River, the Three Gorges Dam. This, there's a lot of stories behind the scenes that people are not seeing. China is very good at controlling the information that comes out of it. And so one of the issues is, is China needs a continual flow of food coming in. Uh, that's grain, that's uh, wheat, that's barley. And also, I, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but I, I do another talk where I talk about this, and that's fishing, uh, the fishing industry. But China is also having to deal with some of the nations they get their grain and ore from, particularly Australia. China and Australia are in a very bitter little fight right now over this. Uh, Australia is the main provider to China of things like coal and iron. But the Australians have been very adamant about crew rotation. So one of the hidden stories, and I'll talk about it in a minute, is, is the ability to rotate crews. And Australia has been very adamant that, that companies, particularly uh, Costco, which is the Chinese overseas shipping company, is not rotating their crews. And so Australia made a fairly large vocal stink about this. And Australia has, has been kind of reaping the, the wind of that in that Australian ships are at the back of the line to offload right now, or, or ships carrying Australian cargo, I should say, they're not Australian ships, are at the back of the line when it comes to discharge. And what China has basically done 
is shifted their concern to getting uh, ore and grain from other sources. So for example, the Cape route uh, from the River Plot, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Brazil, uh, around Cape of Good Hope to uh, the South China Sea, to China is very important. You'll hear a lot about the China and the, Chow and the South China Sea. You'll hear the military talk about that this is a military movement into the South China Sea to take over islands that they created, which is true. But the reason they're doing that is to protect their sea lines of communications. China is very cognizant of the fact that it can be hurt tremendously by cutting off its trade. If you cut the Chinese off from exports and imports, that's the way you hurt China. You don't have to come anywhere close to the coast of China to hurt China. If you stop the flow of goods going there, if you stop ships going into the northern end of the Strait of Malacca or coming out of the Bab el Mandab, the Red Sea, or around the Cape, you're going to hurt China. And this is why we see China, for example, expanding into the South Pacific and also expanding into the Arctic. Uh, one, of the rings, one of the things they want is alternative routes. Should the Malacca Straits be shut off to them, how are they gonna get those, those, those Cape vessels? Well, they'll send those Cape vessels around the Drake Passage the Cape of Good Hope and, uh, uh, excuse me, around uh, Cape Horn and get it coming across the Pacific. It's longer, it's more expensive, but one of the things that the maritime industry indicates when there's an obstacle, the maritime industry will adapt. We saw that with the closing of the Suez Canal in 1956, and we saw it with the closing of the Suez Canal from 1967 to 1973. So the maritime industry will always adapt. And that's why China has such a big presence in areas like the Arctic right now. They're really trying to push that way. I, and I talk a lot about China here, but it's because China, if you add up the Chinese Merchant Marine and, the, and Hong Kong together, uh, the Chinese Merchant Marine is the second largest in the world today. Uh, China has the second largest Navy. They have the second largest Merchant Marine. We have the first largest Navy and the 21st largest Merchant Marine. And it really raises the question, who's the better sea power here? Uh, the next area I wanna talk about here real quick is containers is containerization. So I live in North Carolina. I live about a half hour from where a, uh, a young North Carolinian by the name of uh, Malcolm McLean was born and raised in Maxton, North Carolina. And uh, good old Malcolm McLean uh, is the uh, person we attribute uh, containerization to. You know, when in the 1950s, when he uh, christens the SS Ideal X and sails it from Houston, Texas, up to Newark, New Jersey, a T2 tanker, uh, it's carrying oil, but when it gets to uh, uh, Port Newark, when it comes back up on the Meccano decking, these, this false decking above the piping, he sticks these uh, intermodal containers, you know, uh, 58 of them, and he brings them down. And to see how that has changed the world, you can just look at this evolution, you know, uh, uh, the Ideal X in the mid-50s carrying 58 containers, uh, HMM, uh, which used to be Hyundai Merchant Marine, now it's just HMM. Uh, HMM, which is in an effort, a program here to really outbuild everybody, uh, just christened a dozen container ships. Uh, in a period of two years, they commissioned, they uh, uh, contracted and finished and built 12 container ships that can carry almost 24,000 boxes. It, it, it's a massive escalation in the size of these vessels. Uh, the only limitations on these vessels right now are ports, is draft in the ports and, and container cranes. Uh, that's the real big limitations we see. Almost all these big, huge 20,000 plus box ships are on the uh, East Asia to Europe run. Very few come to the West Coast because the West Coast can't handle them. And that's a whole different issue I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the slide on the left there talks about container ports. Where are the biggest ports in the world? And one of the things that should grab your attention right there is number one, the number of them that are in China, nine out of the top 20 uh, are in China. Uh, this is why when COVID-19 hit and all of a sudden you saw empty berths in Shanghai, uh, in Shizhuan, in, in Zhengzhou, you never see that. You, you never see empty berths in China. I mean, the, the berths are always full. There's always ships coming on. Cargo is always moving. Uh, I had a good buddy who was on a container ship and he was in Shanghai. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. It's deserted. It's empty. Uh, and, and it wasn't quite that bad, but compared to what it usually was, uh, you can see that. Uh, the U.S. Uh, only makes that list with Los Angeles, Long Beach right there. That's the only one. Almost all the major ports that handle containers are in Asia or on the Asia-Europe run. And again, one of the things that we see in the container market is consolidation. 
Uh, on the right there, you'll see the big container companies right there. You see a list of nine of them highlighted. Those nine control about 80% of the world's container trade. And they're organized into these super conferences uh, Maersk and Mediterranean shipping into the 2M. You have the Ocean Alliance, you have the Alliance. Uh, and, and these companies are able to really control through conferences and through agreements sailing. So for example, the route between Asia and Europe right now is, is, is escalating in cost. There's huge demand. One of the things that COVID has done has gotten every one of you, and you know you do it, you order stuff online, you get boxes to your door. I get boxes to my door every day. There's probably a box out there right now I have to go get. We get stuff delivered all the time. Those boxes are basically not going through retail stores here in the US, but they're coming directly from shippers, directly from uh, uh, producers. And so one of the things that we see is this increase in shipping coming across. Plus the slowdown started in March and April of 2020 has never really caught up yet. It's like when you drive down the highway and all of a sudden you slow down for a reason and then speed back up and you don't ever know. That's what's happened with the ocean trade where we're trying to catch up. And there's another issue there that I'll talk about in a second that's, that's magnifying this. But these companies represent 80% of the container firms. And one of the things that they tend to do at times is control the trade. They tend to control the trade. Uh, so for example, they'll blank a sailing, they'll cancel a sailing. And what that does is it increases prices to move containers. Uh, right now on the West Coast of the United States, we're seeing a backlog. If you look at a, a picture or news out of Los Angeles and Long Beach or Seattle and San Francisco right now, there are ships lined up to get at the docks on the West Coast to offload. Uh, and that's because of the backlog coming in. It also has to do with COVID hitting the shore establishments there, not enough workers to get everything in. And I will also bash on this, our poor infrastructure we have in the United States. Our railway capacity, our highway capacity, we don't have enough truck drivers because we don't pay them enough to move the commodities off the berth. And what that means is a lot of our exports is not heading out. Matter of fact, one of the things that these container companies are doing is not taking exports because they just want to take empty containers back to fill them back up because there's a shortage of containers in the world. And there's really not a shortage of containers, there's a shortage of containers at key spots. There are piles of containers in New Zealand. It's just no one's going to go to New Zealand to go get them. And so this is this is a a very important element that we see. And so a lot of our export a lot of our exports are stuck in ports waiting to get out. Uh, the other element that I always talk about with the container industry that's really important to understand is how how susceptible they are to attacks. So I, I do a lot of talks with the military and because the military doesn't understand commercial at all. They, they, they don't, they, they, they have a hard time understanding their own things, let alone when you throw in commercial elements to it. And, you know, the military operates under operational security, very tight knit security. You don't, you know, no sharing. They have the very, you know, all these uh, kind of cybersecurity elements. And one of the things the military loves to do is talk about what the next war will unveil. And, you know, they, they think it's going to be a repeat of previous world wars. Chinese submarines, Russian submarines, sinking vessels on the high seas. It's not going to be that. It's going to be cyber attacks. In, in 2016, Maersk Lines was hit by a massive cyber attack out of Russia, the Napietya virus. Uh, this past year, 2020, we saw every major container line, including the International Maritime Organization, hit by cyber attacks. And understand, these ships have to be linked ashore to be able to move their containers. When you come in with a ship that's 24,000 boxes, you don't have time to think about what boxes you're going to move. This has to be orchestrated. It has to be like a fine-tuned movement. And that means you have to be uploading information, sending it back. A lot of these containers have information that need to be sent regularly. Your, your vaccines coming across the ocean, they have to be kept in refrigerated, super refrigerated containers. That material has to be monitored to make sure that it never goes out of temperature. That means an uplink. And what the Napietia virus did and other viruses did was basically break them up. They get into the system because they're open systems. They're, 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 you have to be able to monitor your system. So it's very hard to have good security for that. At the same time, these container companies want to share information. So you get the trade line system, which where companies basically are trade lines where they basically share systems. IBM working with Maersk there. 
And, and one of the things I had a, a friend who works this uh, refers to the linking of all these systems together. He refers to it as Skynet, which is, which is the, uh, the, the, the bad computer in the Terminator series. Uh, and so, you know, if, if, if you want to stop world trade, you don't do it by sending a torpedo into the HMM Algeciras. You do it by uploading a computer virus. And that's the impact that you see. And, and, and as we get more and more dependent on this just in, just out logistics, uh, disruptions are more susceptible. And then one of the last things I want to talk to you about is, is really the impact of COVID on the seafarers. Uh, 100,000 ships out on the high seas, there's about 1.2 million seafarers out there, 1.2 million seafarers operating the major vessels across the ocean. Uh, most of them are not American. Americans represent a very small um, amount of, of who's out there. Uh, you know, you see mariners from places like the Philippines, India, China. Uh, you see officers coming out of Eastern Europe, uh, Europe Ukraine. Uh, but they're from all over the world. And, and for many mariners, shipping is a great opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity to make more money than they normally would make. They can make money on these vessels and go back home and, and support themselves and their family for a long period of time. But one of the things that we saw happen as a result of COVID-19 is the world passenger transportation system broke down. In normal ports where you would have crew changes, where the crew would get off, get on an airplane, fly back home, and the new crew members would show up, that wasn't happening. South Africa, for example, was a classic example. South Africa shut down, the, uh, Singapore shut down for a long time. These mariners are on board from four months to a max of 11 months based on the uh, 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 international mar uh, maritime uh, labor conventions. Uh, that's how long you're on. And you know, if you can't get off, you're stuck on the vessel, which doesn't sound bad. Well, you're stuck on a vessel, at least you're getting paid, but your relief isn't coming. And if the relief can't come on board, he's got to go get another job to go get it. And then the question becomes, if you're stuck on a vessel over your you know, max 11 months, which is a long, listen, it's a long time to be on a boat. If you're stuck, are you going to go back out again? Because you don't know when you're ever going to get back out uh, home again. And this is causing huge disruptions. We literally saw an Indian bulk ship head to India instead of heading to China to relieve its crew. The captain basically said, no, I'm, I'm changing course. I'm, I'm using my option. I'm going to head home to India to do a crew change. Now, he did a crew change, especially himself. He was fired and, 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 and he was removed. But one of the things that we, we see, especially right now, is uh, kind of two cases here in the upper right there, uh, uh, the Wakio, and then the lower left there, the Stellar Banker, uh, where you know there may be indications that crew fatigue was an issue there, that uh, crew fatigue was an issue. You know, as you populate the ocean with all these ships, that image in the upper left there is from marine traffic, which tra tracks all vessels on the high seas that that have the AIS transponder. One of the things we're seeing is those impacts. We're, we're seeing those impacts now. We saw those impacts actually before this happened. Uh, the, the the image in the lower left there, uh, excuse me, in the, in the lower middle right there. Is, is the image of the Golden Ray. That was a, a car carrier that rolled over in Brunswick, Georgia. Right now they're, they're scrapping the vessel in place. That big crane is basically slicing the vessel into pieces uh, and, and pulling it off. The vessel was leaving Brunswick, heading to Baltimore. They were delivering Kias. Uh, so if you're in Brunswick, Georgia, don't buy a used Kia that says possible water damage. It, don't do it. Uh, but one of the things that had to do with is the, is the brisk pace. That vessel rolled over with, with no indication. And one of the reasons was is because of the tempo of maritime operations. Uh, the ship didn't take ballast water in the port probably because it didn't want to contaminate its tanks. So it was top heavy. It didn't want to shift cargo down to lower decks because that costs money because you got to pay stevedores to do that. And so they were probably leaving port. They were going to ballast out in the cleaner water of the Gulf Stream and head up. And they never made it. She literally just rolled over in Brunswick. If you go to Jekyll Island right now, you'll see her right there. And one of the big prolific stories we see right now, and I mentioned to you before, is in the middle on the right there, is that that lineup of vessels off the West Coast trying to get in. Uh, right now, there are ships lined up trying to get into the port. And there's a breakneck speed to load vessels and get them across. And one of the things that's leading to is loss of containers. Uh, the vessel in the lower right there is the uh, 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 one Apis. Uh, she had a catastrophic loss of containers, about 1,300 containers lost on board. Uh, she was she was routed on a great circle route through the North Pacific in, you know, in, in December. 
uh, and uh, probably didn't have the accurate stowage factors for her containers in terms of weights. Uh, maybe there was inadequate lashing done because they were trying to push the ship off the berth as fast as they can to load other vessels. And one of the things that we're seeing right now is containers floating across the Pacific. Uh, it, it is having a massive impact on this. And one of the things I hope to convey to you all is how, number one, complicated, <laughs> complicated the maritime sector is. There's many moving parts to it. Uh, there's also many parts that don't communicate with each other. And I think one of the biggest things that I try to do is lay this out so that people who do, you know, may have a, a knowledge of some areas or even just a passing little knowledge can understand the appreciation of what the global maritime transportation system does for us and how linked we are to the outside world. Uh, there was never a shortage of toilet paper. There was a shortage of getting toilet paper to you. Remember that. There was plenty of toilet paper out there in the world. There was just the, the issue of getting it to you. And, and that's one of the things we see all the time, that we have an abundance of goods, abundance of resources and material, but the question is, how do you get that there? And one of the things that we have become so used to is being able to receive goods on a timely basis and not have to really stockpile, not have to store. I think one of the things that we've learned as, as, as just normal people is to stockpile a little bit, you know, to have some supplies, you know, have those three, five days of supplies of some certain commodities to have. And industries are doing that. Industries didn't like to do that because it costs money. They don't make money if they got stuff in the warehouse. They don't, you know, retailers don't make money if stuff is in the back of the store. They want to get it in the back door and out the front door as fast as they can. And that means having a cheap, available means of transportation. But again, one of the things that COVID has introduced to us is that you can have not just minor disruptions, but global disruptions. And I, technically, I don't think it's done yet. We're still seeing these disruptions take place. So I want to thank you for having the ability to talk about this, and I'm happy to take questions on the topic. All right, I guess that's my cue. <laughs> uh, Sal, thanks very much. This was um, enlightening, to say the least. Um, so some of the questions, we have a few that were sent in in advance, and uh, just one has come in while you were talking. Um, but one of the questions, um, you, you certainly discussed the shore side implications or the maritime industry implications, but somebody asked about the NBOCC, which is, I just looked it up, non-vessel operating common carrier uh, implications and repair facilities at sea. And I'm assuming it's all a, uh, a domino effect of, of, of that, but if you could address that question, um, sure. how so it has that been affected? No, no, uh, happy to. So uh, let's, uh, ship maintenance and repairs. So one of the big issues that we saw uh, at the start of this was ship maintenance and repair facilities were really going to be overrun because of the issue with the fuel change. Uh, one of the things that you, you do to uh, reduce your emissions was either get that low sulfur diesel, which was going to be at a premium. It was going to be hard to get at some places. And then the other way was to install a system called a scrubber system on your exhaust. And that, had, takes, an, that takes a modification in a shipyard. And so uh, shipyard facilities were really at, at, at a premium at the beginning. Well, then all of a sudden COVID hits, shipping slows down, and more importantly, there's an excess of low sulfur. And the shipyards all of a sudden were not as busy. So one of the things that a lot of shippers did, for example, the, the, the passenger lines did this, is run their ships in the shipyards as quick as they can, get as much maintenance done as they could so the ships would be available. Uh, but one of the things that COVID hit was the shipyards. One of the things we saw was shut down in shipyards. COVID is, is particularly tough in a shipyard environment where you're in such close quarters working on vessels has had a massive increase in, 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 in exposures. And so, you know, the fact is we're consolidating the, the number of shipyards around the world. There's an estimate, there was a report that came out by the Danish Shipping Commission that the number of shipyards and ship facilities has decreased by half over the past 10 years. And, and we're, we're seeing the growth of larger shipyards and ship, you know, ship entities uh, we see the nationalization of them in some areas, Korea, Japan, China, uh, but it's getting very difficult to uh, uh, get repairs done in, in a timely manner. In the United States, for example, uh, U.S. flag vessels have to go into U.S. shipyards. Uh, the problem is they're competing against U.S. Navy, U.S. Coast Guard, other, other vessels, 
And in many cases, they have to pay the, uh, the fine to go to an overseas yard. Matson will go to a Chinese yard, for example, and pay the 50% ad valorem tax because they can get into a Chinese yard. They can't get into a US yard. In, in the terms of the NVOX, uh, uh, NVOCCs, the, the, the best comparison I can give you to, to that is a travel agent for cargo. That, that's basically what they are. You, you contact an NVOC and what they do is they handle the movement of your goods. They, they'll, they'll take care of everything. So for example, in the military, uh, there's a contract with a company and the, in, it, it, the military does to move cars overseas. They don't own any ships at all. What they do is they, they contract out with car carriers to move vehicles overseas. And one of the things we see is, is uh, NVOCs are really, I would argue, in a very interesting position because these co uh, companies, these corporations, have much more access to people than ever before. You know, I can get online, Google, Maersk, and, and, and book my own container almost directly with them and move my goods. And so I don't, you know, I don't need that. You know, same thing with, with travel agents. You don't need travel agents anymore because you can just go on to the airline's webpage or go to Expedia or some other source and, and do it immediately. And, and so, you know, the industry is changing. There's a lot more outreach in the industry for people to be able to move things. Uh, but at the same time, Envox provide a unique experience. Uh, they can get deals that you can't get. And I think that's where you're going to see them really kind of specialize in what they're doing. Um, so a few people have asked uh, about, is the, uh, has COVID accelerated the move to automation? Uh, has it stalled that? I mean, where was that before, do you know? And, and how has that uh, changed? Well, sure. I mean, obviously, one of the things, you know, we talk about those those big massive container ships, you know, you're talking about crews of, you know, you know, a little over a dozen to 20 people on board. And, and that's largely due to a lot of automation that's on board. You know, it's not unusual for ships to be automated engine rooms, unmanned engine rooms. Engine rooms are linked uh, back to uh, 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 the home companies and more importantly to the, the, the engine manufacturers to monitor them. So, you know, automation is, is, pro, uh, is really proliferating. One of the places where you see automation in the maritime industry much more than ever before is in the uh, uh, discharge facilities, in the, in, in the uh, discharge and, and onload ports. You know, it, it's, it's gonna be rarer to see people driving, you know, little trucks around the yards hauling a container. It's gonna be automated. Singapore, China, you see that happening right now. And one of the things we're seeing on the West Coast of the United States is COVID has hit those ports so hard, they can't get gangs to work the containers as much. You don't have as many gangs working the docks as you normally would. Uh, that doesn't happen with automation. You know, if you can automate a container crane, if you can automate the, the carrier that moves the container within the yard around, that doesn't happen. I, I am one of those who believes you're never gonna see a, a completely autonomous vessel because you're never gonna insure it. No, no company is gonna insure a vessel that has nobody on board. You know, no one's going to send a vessel with 23 containers out across the Pacific and hope it arrives on the other end. You know, you're always going to want somebody on board to do it. But I think you're going to see more and more automation come in because just like everything else, it lower costs. Crew costs had always been the expensive element in shipping for a long time. It, it, it's always been the most expensive element. And that's why you saw the proliferation of foreign flags, open registries, crews from other places. I mean, that's why you don't have American flag vessels. We pay American mariners a good salary, you know, but when I can pay a Filipino $900 a month to work on a ship, I'm going to do that. And, and, and so, you know, that, and that's where it really, the, I would argue where automation goes. Once you, you can get automation so that you're, you're not paying as much as that, that's when you're going to see it really take off. Um, one thing before I ask the next question, um, to the people who have submitted questions and those listening, um, Sal has agreed to, as long as it's within a reasonable number, to answer questions we don't have time for, uh, either via email and uh, we'll get them up on the website. Um, Bob H. asks if uh, we'll be able to download the presentation uh, and I'll let Jessica chime in, but I'm pretty sure these go up on our website after the fact. Is that correct, Jessica? Yes, we will make the video uh, available to everybody uh, after the presentation. And so of course those slides will come up on the screen. And Sal, I don't know if you would also be willing if they wanted to sh have a, a PDF of your presentation, is that also possible? Sure, I steal my slides from other people too. I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> 
Okay, so an, a question that came in a little bit late in the game, but I think is is pretty interesting is, and I, I think I know the answer to myself, but is is it our seafarers giving, give, are they being given priority for vaccinations to help this movement of critical shipping back and forth? I know I have a one friend who's a merchant mariner, an officer, and he's, I know he said he was considered, um, um, whatever the category is, but he's gotten both his shots because he's a, a, a ship's officer to get things moving. Is that universal, Sal, do you know? It's, it's not universal. And, and this has been a big effort by the IMO. Now it's up to individual countries to determine whether or not seafarers were essential workers. And, and one of the things that the International Maritime Organization, which is the kind of the UN organization represented by flags by countries, in it was to try to upgrade not just immunizations, but to get them declared as essential workers for purposes of transportation to get them on flights. Because because if you think about it, you know, if you have a ship coming into Los Angeles and you got to rotate out a crew, uh, you got to get that crew off the vessel to LAX to fly out. So I mean, you have to be able to move them through the internal part of your country. And in, in some cases, that wasn't being done. And it has a lot to do with the way the International Maritime Organization was also structured. Uh, a lot of these vessels are under nations that don't have kind of good representation, I would argue, in the IMO. Uh, others are, you know, it, it's more of a company thing. You know, if, if Maersk can make this argument more than, than, than Denmark or Liberia can, I think that, that plays a lot. There's been a big effort, but it has not been entirely successful. There are still issues with rotating crews. There's still issues with get them priority transportation and there's issues with the vaccine. Uh, I mean, unfortunately the vaccine is, is, is not being seen as uh, an essential thing. And of course, you know, even in the United States, the military, the Navy, uh, uh, which operates a lot of merchant ships, you know, one out of five vessels in the US Navy are crewed by American merchant mariners, even though those mariners have priority to be able to get the vaccines, a lot of them aren't taking the vaccines. Uh, and so you have that issue too. And, and so it, it's, it, it's, you're kind of battling a couple of issues there at the same time. Uh, a couple of people has, have uh, asked the same question, and this uh, goes back to your role as a historian versus modern shipping issues, is do you have information on uh, that you can make a com uh, comparison between the 1918 uh, flu pandemic to today's pandemic with regards to seafaring and shipping? Sure. As a matter of fact, I, you know, I did, I did an article for Sea History on uh, the, uh, the sea lift of uh, troops during the First World War. And, and one of the things that was a big issue at the time was the outbreak of, of, of the Spanish flu. Uh, it hits in the spring of 1918. Uh, and you actually have a quandary in the spring of 1918, whether to pack these passenger vessels, these former German passenger vessels, now American troop ships, with troops. And the decision is said, yeah, you got to do it. You got to take the risk. Let's go ahead and do it. Uh, because again, just like our virus, there were peaks and troughs. Spring of 1918 was one, then it kind of fell off. And then in the fall of 1918, it hit again. And then it hit again in the spring of, uh, 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 spring of 1919. Uh, and yeah, we, we saw the outbreak of Spanish flu across. One of the things we've seen on, on, on commercial vessels, except for the passenger liners, except for the cruise liners, is you're able to contain the virus pretty good. It's a self-contained crew, very small number of people on board. You know, and so you know, if you have 18, 20 people, you know, you're able to contain that. It, we haven't seen an outbreak on, we've seen some on some ships, but not a lot across the uh, uh, merchant fleets. And so it hasn't had a, a, a huge impact. Where it was more of an issue in 1918 was the fact that you were moving people. The primary mode of moving people was by ship. And so that had a bigger impact. And, and you know, cruise lines, you, could, you can park a cruise line. No, you know, no one needs to go on a cruise as much as we like to think we do. We don't. But if you need to get across the Atlantic or if you need to travel up the Eastern seaboard because there's no I-95, if you need to get across somewhere, you have to. And, and so you did see more of that on board. And what you would see is the old quarantine. Ships would come in and have to clear the quarantine. And you would sit at the Staten Island Anchorage in New York Harbor, you know, until you would clear of quarantine. Or if you had a, an outbreak on board, you would isolate, take those people off, put them on Ellis Island or wherever else you would have more, or back when we had marine hospitals and, and quarantine them. And so, you know, that element is, is there's some interesting parallels between 1918 and today. All right, I think we're gonna uh, call that good so we can actually end on time. There are a lot of other questions. So I apologize to those whose questions did not get asked live.
but Sal's a pretty good guy and he's got nothing else to do today. So I think he'll be uh, happy to answer those and we'll get those out on the, uh, uh, by what, by email or on our website? How are we gonna do that, Jessica? Uh, we will be posting the video on our YouTube channel. We can also send out an email blast to everybody, but uh, anybody that wants to can also go onto the website directly, uh, chistory.org slash seminars, or if you wanna even, faster link chistory.org slash seminars 2021. We'll get you right to the page. All right. Uh, Sal, I can't thank you enough. Seriously, like uh, it's pretty complicated and uh, I don't know how you ha have so much information <laughs> in your head, but uh, thankfully for us, you do. And so I just really appreciate you taking this time to create this presentation and then give it to us um, today. So I'll hand this off to Jessica. Well, again, I oh, want to also. Sorry, just... <laughs> sorry well... she's my boss. <laughs> I'll let you do that. <laughs> well, I guess I will. I will also reiterate what Deirdre was saying uh, to say thank you. I, I mean, I don't know. I didn't want that this uh, seminar to end. Uh, Sal, it's really interesting and certainly um, some great visuals. Uh, just like a really nice overview of everything. Um, I would like to just. Uh, ask if Birchie wants to come in and say a couple words before we close out the meeting. Thanks, Jessica. Um, uh, Sal, that was an amazing and informative and absolute, it was just no one who has joined us for this past hour can go away without the understanding of what an incredible amount of information and great resources the National Maritime Historical Society has. Um, it's due to our leadership. Uh, Clay, thank you. Ron, thank you, Walter. Um, and to our amazing staff. And um, I ask you to uh, go to Sea History and just look at that, the seahistory.org and look at that, uh, the resource there, what's available there. And uh, the next issue of Sea History is going into your coming into your mailboxes very soon, and we you know we are just um, we are delighted to be able to present this to you. So uh, do uh, do be on the lookout for us because the National Maritime Historical Society is an amazing resource. And again, thank you, uh, Sal. Thank you so much, Clay. Thank you, and uh, we will see you next month. Thank you, Birch. I appreciate the opportunity. And again, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me. I, I enjoy this opportunity. And I, I'm very honored to be considered a trustee uh, with the National Maritime Historical Society. I've been a member for a long time. So I'm looking forward to uh, uh, working even closer with them in the future. Thank you. That's terrific. It's just terrific. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sal. Thank you. And thank you again to everybody who joined us today. Uh, just real quickly, Birchie mentioned that we uh, hope to see you next month. Uh, our next seminar is going to be on Saturday, March 20th. And that's going to be with author Thomas M. Truxus on Great Britain's High Court of Admiralty prize papers. And again, you can find more information about that and register on their website at seahistory.org slash seminars 2021. So once again, thank you all for joining us and thank you again, Sal. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. I hope you all have a lovely weekend.